it is a period of pop culture warfare. YouTube channels striking from hidden and unseen basements. Rain heavy criticism upon Disney Star Wars. Rage is everywhere. During one such battle, the working jellyfish managed to partially review a show of substance. Andor, a modern Disney Star Wars project that proved high in quality. Pursued by countless YouTube commenters furious about Andor's absence from his previous videos, the working jellyfish now prepares for a deep dive into the murky waters of the show to complete a full season review and restore faith to the sheltered harbor. G'day. Well, enough people have asked or commented about the absence of Andor from my Why Do People Hate Disney Star Wars dive, and I'm not above the first rule of mass media. Give the people what they want! Although, funnily enough, the reason Andor was absent from that assessment should be reasonably clear. It was not a factor in the contemporary hatred of Disney Star Wars. In fact, quite the opposite as it would seem. People either really enjoyed it or completely missed it. Regardless, I am more than happy to leave the waters of apathetic despair and into the warm currents of quality content. So let's discuss how a show in the current era of Disney Star Wars broke through the mould of mediocrity to become what may be the best piece of Disney Star Wars content to date, yet somehow didn't garner the audience of shows like The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, actually, it's pronounced Boba Fett. Pseudo-intellectual tuner, I've been incorrectly pronouncing his name for that goddamn long that it's too late to change now. As always, there are a few key factors that set Andor apart, both from its modern Disney Star Wars counterparts and its previous legacy Star Wars forebears. Naturally, we'll cover the positives, the general criticism, and ultimately whether or not it is a fine addition to the work of George Lucas. Before we commence, a reminder of what the working jellyfish's personal metric for Disney Star Wars enjoyment and acceptance is. 1. It needs to be consistent with the works created by George Lucas. 2. It needs to enhance the Star Wars mythos without causing confusion or detracting from it. And 3. Being most important of all, it cannot cause irreparable damage to the lore and characters. Righto, with those preconditions set and you effectively baselined, please check your pressure gauges as I make the calculations for the deep dive. I haven't completed my calculations. I'll make them for you. Before we begin, I want to talk about Andor's reception. There seems to be a few extremes with how the show was received by the fandom. As stated, some really enjoyed it. In a world where a lot of Star Wars recently has felt like Star Wars fanfic, this was definitely something that feels like it was crafted with intent, purpose, and passion. Others thought it was closer to generic science fiction than Star Wars. Star Trek didn't look like Doctor Who. Star Wars didn't look like Blade Runner. Well, now it does. Now it looks exactly like Blade Runner. And 2001. And about 20 other movies it's ripping off. And we'll take a look at that criticism shortly. While many others slept on or bypassed it entirely. As for the latter, I assess there are a few reasons for that. Chief among them being that Andor's character was not a legacy draw card like Obi-Wan Kenobi and... <sighs> Boba Fett. <coughs> Much like the Ahsoka series, Andor had a big hill to climb in terms of drawing new viewers to the show based off the name in isolation. Not an impossible task, but a big hill all the same. I won't lie, when I heard Andor was in production back in 2020, I wasn't excited. And this was in a time before Star Wars apathy had taken hold. I remember thinking, what, Andor? The dude was in one movie and he died at the end of it. How much more to his story do I really need? The premise felt unnecessary. Less of a story that needed telling and more of an excuse to cash in on the success of Rogue One. Not to mention that it was announced alongside some, at the time, very promising projects. Ahsoka, Obi-Wan, Rogue Squadron, Rangers of the New Republic, and The Bad Batch, all coming off the back of the success of Mandalorian Season 1 and The Clone Wars Season 8. So even prior to the disappointing small screen hitouts between 2020 and 2023, Andor could have still been easily missed when placed alongside some of these absolute pop culture giants of Star Wars. This did, however, likely work in the show's favour in terms of studio meddling, but we'll tug on that string of conjecture later. But why am I bringing this up? Resurfacing old pain long successfully buried in the depths of the ocean. Well, it's important to remember that there was a time, not so long ago, when there was plenty of hope for Star Wars on the small screen. And while the dark side clouds everything currently, 
which did begin around the same time as the sequel trilogy for some, it wasn't always the case. And it's easy to be a revisionist when it comes to Star Wars, noting how far things have declined. But the lack of star power associated with the name of the show should not be so easily discounted merely because poor quality shows on Disney Plus have become the norm in recent years. That said, there is no denying that Obi-Wan Kenobi and Boba Fett affected any excitement for the upcoming small screen Star Wars projects let alone ones based on relatively unknown characters, effectively tarnishing the goodwill of the brand garnered by The Mandalorian with their lack of quality. So why would anyone take a chance on Andor if Disney couldn't even be bothered getting their legacy characters right? That question alone is one that plenty should ponder, as it is likely the key reason for Andor's lack of viewership, with Disney Plus going as far as to push it to Hulu for more numbers. And I don't blame any of you if you haven't seen Andor yet, because I too slept on the series. Like many of you, I'm sure, for understandable reasons. Regardless of the reason it may have been passed over, fortunately, despite being very late to the party, I am here to tell you that if you haven't had a chance to view Andor yet, you should reconsider. But I don't expect you to just take my word for it. So let's take a look at what makes Andor worthy of your time. The first crab off the bank is Andor's execution. No, not his death in Rogue One, I'm talking about the storytelling implementation. Andor is the best looking Disney Plus Star Wars show to date by design. Rather than a reliance on the computer generated environments of the volume, as seen in Mando, Boba and Kenobi, Andor is principally shot on location and on large sound stages. You know, the same ones used for the filming of the original trilogy and the spiritual home of Star Wars. This alone sets Andor apart from its modern contemporaries, as it makes the environments not only tangible for the actors, who can actually react rather than just act, but is also refreshing and believable for the viewer. That's you. The human eye is always more accepting of physical sets or a real location versus a CGI one. No matter how photorealistic those environments may be, I don't want to downplay the work of CGI artists, particularly in the modern era where they're completely overworked, because when the volume is utilised to its full capacity, the results can look amazing. The reverse though, when the technology is employed by a less experienced or even less talented director, can look amateurish at best, and at worst, hot garbage. However, sets and location are only as good as the action taking place upon them, and Andor delivers on this for the most part. Andor, unlike Kenobi and Boba, was not originally a film screenplay rebranded and stretched into a television series, and as a result, is written as such. The story is effectively broken up into three episode mini-arcs that focus on different groups of characters that drive the action, with an overarching plot tying all these characters together. These three episode arcs allow for character development and world building to occur organically, giving the characters and plot room to breathe and building the stakes and tension before the inevitable third act slash episode, where the majority of the action takes place. Action that is now clearly framed for both the characters and story and will have tangible consequences for both. And I can't tell you how refreshing it is to see a well-developed world with fleshed out characters that make logical decisions that ripple cause and effect consequences throughout the show. On this channel, I bang on quite a bit about shows being all flash and no substance, and this is what I'm talking about, but in the reverse. I am a huge fan of stakes and consequences in storytelling, so to see it done well like it is in Andor, jiggles my jellies. This level of storytelling should be an established norm for modern entertainment companies, rather than a celebrated exception. But it is what it is. But much like the show itself, perhaps I should illustrate the point rather than just telling you it is the case. Be warned, mild and or season 1 spoilers are inbound. The short version of the plot, trimming out all the B plots of other characters, is five years before the Battle of Yavin, Cassian is searching for his sister, from whom he was separated as a child. His search leads him into a confrontation with two Imperial security contractors. Naturally, this confrontation goes sideways when Cassian accidentally kills one of them while resisting and then murders the second to cover his tracks. 
Also, I love how this scene depicts just how far Cassian's character progresses between now and when we see this scene mirrored in Rogue One. We'll be alright. Hmm? The deaths are then investigated, which identify Cassian and his home planet. Cassian, now on the run, has limited time before he is found and is forced to sell some stolen Imperial tech in order to finance his escape. This garners the attention of a rebel orchestrator known as Luthor, who agrees to buy the tech, but is less interested in the value of the device and more interested in Cassian's ability to come across such items. The pair are tracked down by the Imperial investigators during their meeting on Ferrix, which leads to another confrontation. The locals, being anti-imperial due to a previous and heavy imperial occupation of their planet, indirectly assist Cassian and Luthor to escape, but not before more imperial agents are killed. Cassian escapes and subsequently goes on several other three episode arcs, all of which are as well written as the first, if not more so. But when he finally returns home, he finds it is now fully occupied by the Empire, courtesy of the carnage caused in his escape, as well as his other anti-imperial antics we've seen throughout the show. With the iron grip of the Empire now firmly on Ferex, anti-imperial sentiment rises to the point of breaking point, leading the populace to openly rebel against the occupation. I've done my best to give you the wave tops of Cassian's story in Season 1 without deeply spoiling key story arcs, because if there's a chance you haven't seen the show, I genuinely want it to remain unspoiled so you can go and enjoy it the same way I did. It's so rare in modern entertainment that we get storytelling of this calibre, particularly in the field of Star Wars. But hopefully you can see, even from this brief summary, the cause and effect storytelling that forms the backbone of the series. The plot is driven by character actions, grounded and believable decisions are made that have logical reactions and consequences. Rather than the plot being driven forward by a MacGuffin of convenience, with pseudo-random payoffs appearing to cover up poor writing decisions. But despite being full of praise for the series, I'd like to take this opportunity to address one of the major criticisms I've seen levelled at Andor. Through copious amounts of research, which definitely extend further than my own comment section, I've seen the criticism that Andor is poorly paced, i.e. it's very slow. And to be fair, when briefly summarising the show for you just now, I can understand how that argument holds water. Particularly when modern Star Wars storytelling has amounted to mashing two action figures together and calling it a plot. I said this in my first video about Andor that nobody watched, a bit like the show itself. <laughs> but it is a slow burn. And if I'm being hypercritical, I would say that it could use with a good edit. I do believe it would be possible, in most instances, to compress the three episode arc to two, drawing out story threads of importance, while also compressing other scenes that may not have as much narrative weight. I say narrative weight because, despite some scenes in Andor overstaying their welcome, and the pace dragging in terms of build-up episodes, Every scene, no matter how small, serves the narrative, either in terms of character development or world building. Sometimes, dare I say it, both at the same time. Unlike so many other Disney Star Wars projects that would rather rely heavily on fan service in order to hide their lack of depth. So while I agree that this is a genuine criticism that should not be discounted, I believe it is more a byproduct of the modern entertainment industry rather than a problem with Andor itself. I was personally gripped from the first episode and basically binged watched the entire show in one sitting. But this would be a problem if the show was being released episodically because it didn't have a payoff at the end of each episode. Not to mention that national attention spans are getting shorter and shorter, as well as the fast food entertainment mentality that's come with Star Wars. You don't turn up to McDonald's expecting a prime rib steak. Because no matter how good that steak is, if you're expecting a greasy burger, you're at best going to be confused and at worst very disappointed. Oh dear, I've drifted off course. My point is, I understand that criticism. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. But I accept it. But I think it holds less weight than other criticisms I've seen, which we will discuss later. Despite pacing issues, the plot is supported by competent direction and, at times, absolutely fantastic performances from an experienced cast. Some performances are so good that they outshine the title character. Andy Serkis and Fiona Shaw being two such examples. That's just love. Nothing you can do about that. 
I'm not crying, you are. So when you put all of this together and see the competent execution at all levels, from actor to director to writer and special effects supervisor, the themes and associated wank that has become so important to modern film analysis for some reason actually land because they're supported and complemented by quality filmmaking, rather than being the focus and ultimately a detriment to the project. Odedra, um, when we meet her, she's working uh, for the ISB and she's so um, proud to be doing that, but she's surrounded by what she considers to be quite inept men, mostly. Um, well, no, all men, really. Mm. And they seem to be missing what she can see. Honestly, this was another thing that nearly turned me off and or completely in the lead up to its premiere. The unchecked personal hang-ups of the actors working on the show. We need to put these meat puppets back in their box after the directors finish playing with them. But fortunately, the actual show of Andor speaks for itself, rather than being just a soapbox for modern Hollywood ideology. But perhaps we should compare some scenes from Andor to the other works of Disney Star Wars, otherwise we run the risk of me going on a rant about the current state of modern Hollywood, and nobody wants that. Wouldn't you rather give it all at once to something real? Let's start by comparing some of the action scenes, because it should be no surprise to anyone that on this channel I've been a little bit disenchanted with the representation of the Stormtroopers in Disney Star Wars. And before we get any Return of the Jedi Ewok haters, let me just say... <laughs> I'm pretty sure Return of the Jedi used Ewoks because they were half the size of Wookiees, therefore half the price, and Hollywood was taxing the shit out of George Lucas for the privilege of making the film. So if you're going to blame anyone, blame those damn 1970s Hollywood financiers. Anyway, what impressed me most about Andor's action sequences, apart from the implementation of basic military tactics, employed to prevent avoidable deaths, was how grounded and real they felt. And by that I mean it didn't break my suspension of disbelief. The trope of stormtroopers being effectively pop-up targets in the modern era of Disney Star Wars has been something that's bothered me for a long time. So it was so refreshing in Andor to watch a shootout between two sides that actively cared about casualties. Gone are the faceless stormtroopers mowed down indiscriminately, replaced by actual humans that felt like they were trying to fight for their lives, and subsequently with each death feeling like it had significance, like there would be repercussions and consequences as a result, not only for the villains, but for the protagonists as well. This actually meant that there were stakes in every shootout, and because there'd normally been a two episode lead up to a particular shootout, I found myself worrying about all the characters. And this is only enhanced in one of the smaller arcs when our heroes don't have any weapons, with guards that do have them. The stakes have been clearly established in previous fights, and now our heroes are grossly outgunned. This is fantastic visual storytelling as it is less about spectacle without any substance, and more about the personal stakes for the characters in the fight. On the topic of weapons in Andor, I better address another criticism that I've seen, and I also had personally. For the record, I am very aware that the E-11 blaster is based on the Sterling submachine gun. But in 1977, the Sterling submachine gun, despite being used in the Second World War, was a relatively unrecognisable weapon, particularly with the E-11 modifications of removing the stock, shortening the magazine, and adding attachments to the barrel and sight, ultimately creating a very iconic weapon that the audience had never seen before. What it wasn't was one of, if not the, most widely used and recognised firearms on the planet. I've got no excuse for this one guys, they didn't even bother to modify it, it is a Kalashnikov AK variant. And while there's something almost comically appropriate about Kalashnikov's AK-74 being used in a galaxy far, far away to overthrow a tyrannical military government, it is something that will take, I'm guessing, the majority of the audience out of the scenario given how infamous and widely recognised that weapon is. And while I appreciate that this is in keeping with the traditions of the OT Star Wars, 
I'm more inclined to call this lazy prop work than faithful homage. But all things considered, this is a relatively minor nitpick. But that is an appropriate segue to talk about another relatively minor nitpick that saw the most popular Star Wars channel on YouTube absolutely memed as a result. The bricks, uh, again, you know, we've seen bricks in Star Wars many times, but it looked like someone had literally just slapped together some bricks and cement and uh, lazily. And again, maybe it's just the old rustic look of the village to look like regular people have done this and not the city or, or not uh, machines. So perhaps, but at the end of the day, you know, when you have screws in the security camera, I'm like, this just looks like something from Earth, right? And I didn't really like that. I didn't really enjoy that. Screw you creepo. Now, I understand where this criticism is coming from. He's speaking in terms of immersion. The bricks and screws took him out of the show. And while there have been bricks and screws used in Star Wars previously, there was a concerted effort from George Lucas, Ralph McQuarrie and the production team of the original trilogy and prequels to make Star Wars feel like a galaxy far, far away. So when you see things in Star Wars that burst that bubble, like spectacles or AK variants, I can appreciate that immersion is broken. However, I'm not inclined to agree with Star Wars theory in this instance. Namely because the bricks in Andor are an important part of the planet's culture and actually go a long way to serving the narrative in the final episode. But I won't give spoilers away on that particular part. I guess the real critique here, despite being somewhat valid, nests quite comfortably alongside the critiques of Robot Head. Do these immersion-breaking inclusions, alongside the modern sci-fi genericisms, divorce Andor from the Star Wars DNA to the point where it's no longer recognisable without a Star Wars sticker on it? True enough, the original trilogy had more in common with a fantasy space opera than it did with traditional science fiction. And in Andor, the fantasy elements are well and truly removed in favour of a grand personal story. However, I think this is more of a strength of Andor as a show and its storytelling, having the confidence to steer away from the stories of the Jedi and not desperately cling to the high watermarks of Star Wars iconography like other Disney Star Wars shows have. There are enough small references in the show, including the title character and the scenes on Coruscant, to definitely place it firmly in the Star Wars universe. Would the show have benefited from other characters from Rogue One, like Krennic or Galen? In Season 1, I don't think so. That said, I'm sure we'll get more of these inclusions in Season 2, now that the show has proven itself on its own merits. I honestly wish more Disney Star Wars shows would take this approach, steering away from the iconic legendary characters and using the lesser known ones to tell new stories. But I can see the point. Would Andor have worked as a standalone Star Wars film? Probably not. In the same way characters like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Boba Fett were not meant to be converted to small screen shows with filler episodes. Some characters are better suited to the dramatic epic for which they were written. Whereas characters like Andor are perfect for the lesser dramatic shows that should be the focus of Disney+. Plus, Because the cost of getting those stories wrong would be far less damaging than what they've done to Obi-Wan Kenobi, Boba Fett and Darth Vader. But perhaps the issue here is that people are somewhat butthurt by the fact that Andor was such a good show without any of the iconography. And I get it, it's a little bit of a slap in the face. How can they get this obscure character so right and screw up the legendary ones so horribly? But as I said, sprinkling a little bit of salt on the scenario, I believe this is because the Eye of Sauron, aka Kathleen Kennedy, was too busy focusing on things like screwing up the sequel trilogy, hanging Obi-Wan Kenobi out to dry, and getting into a dick measuring contest with Jon Favreau, to really focus on what the production team of Andor was getting up to. And when proven creative types are left alone to do their best work, without studio meddling, you get good products. So in this jellyfish's perspective, Andor is absolutely a fine addition. For me, it feels very much like an old EU novel. One I can sit down and comfortably enjoy without worrying about it tarnishing the canon, while also enjoying it on its own merits and not stressing about how it ties into the larger picture. And while I agree it's frustrating that a lot of my favourite characters' shows haven't panned out on a level of quality the way Andor did, and don't even get me started on the sequel trilogy, I'm at least glad Andor is proof that quality Star Wars can still be produced under the Disney regime. It very much feels like a rebel coup that the show was even made. And if that's not the finest indictment I can give the creators of Andor, I don't know what is. Don't get me wrong, I have some other slight nitpicks about the narrative. I keep having this nagging feeling that I've forgotten something. Hey, if you forgot it, it probably wasn't all that important. Yeah, I guess. 
Hemos abierto el But I don't want to go into them because I really don't want to ruin Andor for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. So what are you waiting for? Feel free to leave your sub in the sheltered harbour, Skipper. I'll take good care of her. She, she won't get a scratch. And go and give Andor another chance. But remember, I'm just a brainless lump who's thoroughly enjoyed talking about a show of quality for a change. Uru, mate. <laughs>